very glad to be back in the Institute and especially to be, to be looking at cooperation with uh, Japan in a very important area. A country, Japan, where I served for just two brief years in, in, in the embassy between 2000 and 2002 under Ambassador Porrick Murphy with uh, my colleague Frank O'Donoghue, who's in the audience, who's still, who's still working on, on Irish and EU-Japan relations, and where some of the most dynamic leadership on, on Irish, and European, J J Irish and European relations with Japan were, of course, provided as ever by Tom Hardiman, whom I'm delighted to see here today. I'm very pleased that we can talk now about um, common challenges. We've looked, we've, looked at, we've looked at our own situation, we've looked at Japan's situation, but what we're going to look at now, I think, are some of the, the, some of the most pressing common challenges that none of, us, uh, none of us can escape and none of us should try to escape. Uh, Japan has shown great leadership on global challenges and on development, where it is, in volume terms, the fifth largest provider of official development assistance globally. The European Union collectively provides just about 55% of total ODA, total official development assistance. And Ireland, as current presidency of the European Union, but also as a, 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 a central element of our foreign policy, regards development issues as central to foreign policy issues. Uh, and we have a, a, a tradition and, and, and of, of providing assistance, but more importantly, working in the area of, of development and learning all the time how the global challenges of development uh, are more than just uh, the provision of uh, assistance. Uh, it's 40 years now since the Irish government established its uh, aid programme, and I think it's very important to note that, that is, it's not a coincidence that that coincides with our accession to the then EEC, current European Union, because that is one of the, that is one of the, I suppose, obligations that you take on board when you join the European Union, which is to look at a development, at the provision of assistance to those in the world who are less well off uh, than, our, than ourselves. So I think uh, the European Union has, the, the heads of state and government have just completed their uh, negotiations on the multi-annual financial framework. And while the Commission and uh, NGOs and many others might have felt that the amount provided for uh, development instruments was not as high as they would have hoped, we regard it as very important that it still represented an increase, no matter how slight, over the previous uh, multi-annual financial framework. And that at a time when, as you know, budgets everywhere and budgets, uh, EU budgets are under, under um, great uh, pressure. Ireland and Japan are two very different countries, but we have taken on board uh, uh, a sense of the need to work on development issues, reflecting a sense of our responsibility, our moral responsibility, but also, crucially, I think, our interests, both nationally and uh, globally. Japan's program is quite different from ours in some respects, but as we heard from Yamada-san earlier, uh, Japan makes a major, major um, contribution uh, in Africa through the TICAD initiative. And we, in our way in Africa, are a much smaller but a prominent actor nonetheless. We cooperate with Japan in some still relatively small respects in Uganda and in Zambia. And I think there is great potential for Ireland and for Japan to cooperate uh, more closely in Africa. So just very quickly to give you a sort of a broad oversight of what our development program uh, looks like at the moment, the context where we are coming from as presidency of the European Union as a, and entering the debate on, on, on global development. We have a program that is completely untied. Uh, it is completely uh, provided in the form of grants, uh, no loans. We have now at the moment eight priority countries or program countries where we have a commitment to long-term strategic assistance. Seven of those are in Africa and one very interestingly, is, is Vietnam in, in, in Asia, obviously. And there was, among the development community, for want of a better term, a little bit of unease and questioning about why we opened a, a program in, in, in Vietnam. But I think you only have to visit that country to see exactly why we opened. Because what we're seeing there is a country which is moving through the different phases of development moving into middle income status or towards middle income status and where you can see that we 
can see our own programme moving from the provision of working with government for the provision of basic services through economic assistance, learning from our experiences. To be very honest, we had a, in 2008, we were planning a programme there, which in the slight hubris of the moment was, was to have been known to the it was, was to be known as the Celtic Tiger uh, program, but uh, it, that name uh, <laughs> disappeared pretty quickly. And it's where, Japan, where Vietnam had asked to learn from our experiences. Well, now we've been able to learn, they've been able to learn and, and we've been able to share experiences for good and for ill in economic growth and in building up an economy. And for instance, our Economic and Social Research Institute, our central bank and other institutions work through the program in Japan. Also, our Enterprise Ireland uh, trade promotion uh, people work in Vietnam through the Irish Aid Programme. So some of the barriers which were seen in the past in terms of development programmes have been broken down because we can see that development is not just about the provision of aid for basic services, it's about helping uh, countries in their interest and in our interest to, to, to move through the phases of development so that they can drive their own development. Once you've built up the social services, inevitably you're focusing much more on economic activity and on trade activities. So I think we will have a lot to learn in our African programs from uh, our program in Vietnam. And I think it's fair to say that Vietnam is a country where you could look ahead and you could see the point at which our relationship with Vietnam would move, would change away from the provision of aid towards uh, much more exclusively a sort of a political cooperation and a mutually beneficial economic and trading relationship. That's to divert slightly, but I think it's just important to make, to make, to make those points. Nonetheless, over 80% of our uh, assistance and our aid program uh, goes to Africa, to Sub-Saharan Africa. We provide about uh, two-thirds um, in bilateral aid, one-third multilateral. Uh, we channel about 30% of it through non-governmental organizations. We work particularly closely with them, probably because of the experience over the years of Irish volunteers and missionaries in working in Africa and the very strong non-governmental sector that we have here. And our focus is very strongly on uh, the fight against extreme poverty and on hunger. And we have made a, a, a very strong priority in recent years on focusing on the global hunger crisis, not just in terms of food price crises, such as there was in 2008, but the chronic systemic crisis that exists, which leaves uh, some 900 million people without enough to eat in our high technology, in our high technology world. A world which actually has the resources to feed the people, and uh, the technology, there are very simple solutions available to end the hunger crisis, and yet we have to ask why they, have not, why they are not being adopted. We look at, um, in particular, in our program, smallholder farmers, building up smallholder farmers, which is one of the, in Africa, 80% of smallholder farmers are women, and it's one of the most effective ways of building broad income growth in Africa is to, is to look at smallholder farmers, to look at new varieties of seeds and agricultural practices. And we had some very interesting discussions with uh, Bill Gates on this uh, just a few weeks ago when he visited Ireland. And also on the issue of nutrition, which hadn't been looked at much before in terms of development. It was seen as a, a non-development issue. And the scaling up nutrition movement in which Ireland has taken a leadership role and Japan has taken a leadership role is actually looking at the impact you can make on societies and individuals by focusing on the first two years of a child's life. The first two years, if you intervene uh, in the right way in terms of providing nutritious food, you can make changes which then feed into uh, education and society and economic growth. If you miss those two years, there's no way you can get them back and you're dealing with a situation of uh, child stunting and a complete missing out on the potential that, uh, that, that those children have for their countries and for their societies and for their uh, economies. Ireland's um, official development assistance now stands at about 0.5% of our GNP. Back in the 1970s, through a whole series of cumbersome negotiations, the international community arrived at the objective of spending 0.7% of GNP on development assistance. It's not the best measure of the contribution you make, especially in, 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 in a changing world, 
but it's the measure we have and it's the measure against which we hold ourselves and others to account. Uh, and Ireland, uh, as I say, having reached in 2008 0.59% of GNP, is now providing around 0.5%. Now, our experience in 2008 was a very good example of how it's not the best measure because we were racing in volume terms to increase, to chase after our very high GNP growth rates. When, we cut, when the government cut the program in 2009-10 by about 30%, because our GNP fell so precipitously in, the, in those years, we, we still did not fall below 0.5% uh, in, 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 in our... So I don't think it wasn't... The 0.7% the measure wasn't designed for economies that are booming and collapsing. It's designed for a much more... Um, uh, a much calmer uh, way of running your economy. Nonetheless, we are, on the latest measure, the, the eighth, joint eighth highest provider of development assistance in per capita terms. So in areas where our reputation may have taken a dip over recent years, development hasn't been one of them, and that's why we regard it as essential. It's an argument we always make every year when ministers are fighting in budgets. The reputation of the country, we believe, is one, another, another, another reason why we should maintain a, a strong uh, development policy. Therefore, we have been very, we have been very pleased actually that this six months of our presidency is the particular six months that it is, because this is a period where the world is looking to the framework for international development post-2015. We've been working under the Millennium Development Goals since 2000, which set very clear, tangible targets uh, for the reduction of poverty, but the world is changing and the MDGs come to their target date is 2015, and our presidency takes place at the start of the period of substantive discussion of the post-2015 international development framework. So we, in development, we have three broad areas for our uh, priorities for our um, presidency. One is to get a strong EU united position for the event which will be the UN event which will take place uh, in September in the UN General Assembly week 25th of September probably uh, on what to do to reach to maximize progress on the MDGs and to start looking at post 2015. Our second priority is to make greater progress on linking actions and funding uh, on, on humanitarian relief, response to emergencies, and long-term development, so that we don't make the mistakes that have happened so often before, where you go into a crisis, um, feed the starving, and leave, only to find that the, there is a chronic uh, structural crisis and, the, and famine returns, say, five or six years uh, later. And thirdly, we want to and we believe this is very important, not just for the effect on people's lives, but also to make the best use of funding that is available, to break down the, the, the barriers that still exist uh, in thematic approaches. You often find in development that your education people don't talk to your health people, who certainly don't talk to your climate people, and who don't talk to um, your water and sanitation people. And we, we are looking in particular at the links between hunger and nutrition and the effects of climate change, uh, and we are organizing a international major international conference in April, along with the Mary Robinson Foundation and the World Food Programme, on those three themes and how, they, uh, how the experience in the daily lives of um, communities in poor countries can feed into the post-2015 debate. Now, we held the infor an informal meeting of development ministers in Dublin just two weeks ago in Dublin Castle, and we brought to it in order to open the post-2015 debate, we brought in outside speakers. We brought in Mary Robinson, we brought in the deputy head of USAID, we brought in Amina Mohammed, who is the um, uh, special representative of the Secretary General on, on post-2015, in order to have that first substantive debate among EU ministers. We brought in three, development, well, three commissioners, development, humanitarian affairs, and crucially, environment. And I'll come to the significance of that uh, very shortly. Um, and we looked for the first time really within the EU at substance rather than process. Everyone knows the European Union loves process, but you have to every now and then move a little beyond it to talk about, to talk about, about substance. One of the criticisms of the MDGs is that they were handed down from on high 
and that there wasn't enough consultation. So we are now in a year of global consultations internationally, which is a great period to be in, but of course next year will be much more difficult as we have to make choices and look at how we focus our, our, our objectives and our, and our goals. But it is true that the context, the context, the global context is hugely different today from what it was in 2000. It is different nationally and it's different, it's different, it's different globally. But first of all, just to set out very briefly what has been achieved by the generation of action and resources under the Millennium Development Goals. All too often, development assistance is seen as a bit of a luxury or something you do in good times, the charity notion. We would argue that it's, 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 it, this isn't charity, it's interest, but it's also effective. And people say all too often that development assistance is, is not effective. And yet, since 2000, the, number, the percentage of people living on less than $1.25 a day has fallen uh, from 43% to 22%. The target of having that percentage was reached in 2010. And yet still, with population growth, 1.3 billion people still live in extreme poverty. 900 million people face hunger. Um, on the success side again, between 1990 and 2010, 2 billion people gained access to safe drinking water. Primary school enrollment over the past 10 years is, has, has risen enormously and is now at 89% with, a, with, with moves towards gender parity. Uh, although still far too many people are out of school and still you have to look at the issue of quality and you have to look at pushing that through to secondary and, and, third, and, th and third level. Disease, children, the chances of children dying from disease has fallen considerably. HIV infections are falling in large part due to the uh, retroviral drugs and huge investment uh, across the board uh, in, in internationally. Global ODA over those 10 years rose by 70% to some 96 billion, with the EU providing in 2011 53 billion of that. But also, crucially, it's not just because of ODA, and that's a really important point. Trade, global trade has increased hugely in the years to... Um, uh, from 2000 to 2009, global exports rose 40%, but exports from developing countries rose 80%. So you can see that the future actually does lie. Once you've once you plug the gaps and provide the basic services, trade is going to be trade and economic growth are the engine uh, for development. If we can get if we can get to uh, that point, so there are new opportunities, new contexts. The MDGs have had successes. They missed, they missed certain areas. They didn't necessarily, they perhaps looked more at quantity rather than quality. Uh, the issue of gender equality perhaps wasn't uh, addressed as clearly and specifically as it might have been. Michel Bachelet, Bachelet the, head, the former president of Chile, who's now the head of UN Women, was in, in, in Ireland last week. And she made the point that we all agreed it was politically correct not to have specific goals on gender equality, but to, but to mainstream them across everything, except that that lost political visibility. And frankly, it didn't, it didn't, didn't advance gender equality to the extent that, that it should have. Um, we believe that the goals perhaps didn't look sufficiently at the drivers of hunger and especially on the, on the issues of, 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 of nutrition. And also, in the changing context, we have to take a different approach. I mean, the emerging, there are new actors in development. The private sector is more involved. The emerging economies are more involved. The, the geography of poverty is shifting. The majority of poor people, as we heard at the conference last week that was held in Dublin, will soon be living in cities. Uh, and the majority of poor people will be living uh, in, in middle-income countries, while at the same time sub-Saharan Africa in particular be is an area that is lagging behind on, 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 on all these measures. There is one particular measure that, is, that, is, that is, is, has been almost really difficult to shift, and that's the issue of maternal mortality. The, the numbers of women dying in childbirth remains far too high and hasn't been reduced to the same extent of some of those other measures that, that we have. So the questions of population growth and climate change do, it's clear that they are posing the threat of undermining the progress has, that has been made. I mean, one statistic that I saw is that not just in terms of long-term development, but just in terms of the, the, the just in terms of the, resources that have to be devoted to natural disasters. Since 1992, some 750 billion has had to be devoted to coping with natural disasters. And there have been 1.3 million deaths from natural 
disasters. And these, uh, Japan is very well aware of this experience from, from its own experience. And I know that Japan has played a major role in focusing attention on how to cope uh, with, with natural disasters. Likewise, the processes that we've set up to deal with, with, with these challenges, these global challenges, are still too separate. And for instance, climate change discussions have taken place in one forum. Development discussions have taken place in another. At a time of huge budgetary pressure, we've agreed budgetary targets, financing targets for development, and in theory, or in principle, separate targets for climate change, for overlapping activities, actually, and also with the knowledge that probably the developed countries are not going to meet those. So we have a huge issue of, uh, of, of, of bringing together uh, our analysis of the challenges we face, but also how we're going to generate, um, uh, generate uh, resources to meet them. Even the arrangements that we put together for post-2015 are segmented. The Rio Conference on Sustainable Development last year decided to set up an open working group in the United Nations to uh, try and craft sustainable development goals. There's a high-level panel co-chaired by David uh, uh, Cameron, uh, under the, uh, under the auspices of the UN Secretary General, looking at post-2015 and the Millennium Development Goals. And yet we are all agreed that these two processes are supposed to bring us to a state where we try to put together a single set of new goals, not sustainable goals and development goals, but one set of goals for the international community post-2015, Ideally, with universal application, although it's easy to say that, and there was great agreement on that at the informal development minister's meeting, but then what exactly does that mean if every country is to be held account across a whole set of goals? And also, does that mean that the fight against extreme poverty gets relegated, or does it mean that we don't generate the same action and resources as we did, as, as we did before? So I think, as we see it at the moment, we would hope that post-2015, we maintain and strengthen the international community's fight against uh, extreme poverty. We address the gaps that there, are, have, that there have been in the Millennium Development Goals. We perhaps set ourselves the goal, which has been talked about, of eliminating extreme poverty in the world in a generation, which is achievable. But we have to be realized that we can't do so without addressing issues of environmental sustainability and the limits of the planet and the resources of the planet uh, where we live. There's a fundamental link between global environmental sustainability and the eradication of poverty. Uh, and, and, and the crafting of these uh, objectives and the uh, creation of uh, international um, momentum behind addressing and fighting for these objectives is a huge challenge, I think, for the global community over the next uh, two years. And I just would conclude by saying that one thing I think is clear in setting goals and, and is that to galvanize public and government support, and that is absolutely crucial, to galvanize public and government support, to generate financial resources, both from government, from private sector, and from innovative sources of financing, the great phrase that is always used when we're not 100% sure where the, the gap in financing is going to be, is, is, is going to come from, and to ensure that we generate action and not just aspirations. I think we can say at this stage that whatever goals we do agree will have to be very clear, they'll have to be understandable to the public, they'll have to be measurable, statistically robust, and politically feasible. They'll have to deal with both quality and quantity, and uh, they, will have to, they will have to galvanize, as I said, the support not just of the development professionals, not just of government, but of the public. So that's the challenge that we and the global community face. Uh, it's, 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 it's often doesn't receive the attention that it deserves because the issues involved are perhaps so huge. We often only come to these issues when there's a natural or man-made disaster. But it is clear that given the resources of the planet, given the way we're use, using them, uh, and given the persistence of uh, poverty and uh, the growth in our population, that we actually cannot avoid these, uh, these, these, these issues, and that they're vital foreign policy issues that need to be addressed now rather than when 
the disastrous uh, increase. And in our, in our presidency in the next few months, we will be hoping to guide the European Union towards uh, council conclusions uh, for the September 2013 uh, UN event. We want to try and do so, and this is, this is an enormous challenge, is to work with the European institutions to ensure that the environment and development foreign affairs ministers can adopt the same set of council conclusions. If we can do that, we will have achieved something uh, that people thought was not possible. Now, hopefully then you translate that great achievement into action that affects people's lives rather than just words on paper in Brussels. Um, and then uh, we would hope that also in June, when the G8 uh, meet uh, in, in Northern Ireland, uh, we are working with uh, Prime Minister Cameron uh, to ensure that there is somewhere in that process a sufficient focus on the issue uh, of, of hunger and poverty. Um, and also then we will move to the UN process in, in, in September, where the international community has to decide how to move from September 2013 to a, a major summit meeting, perhaps in the first half of 2015, to adopt these goals and this new approach that uh, I have been talking about. And Ireland, again, there I'm glad to say, has a role to play as our ambassador in the UN has been, uh, is the co-facilitator for that September 2013 event. So we have a busy agenda. Uh, I look forward to hearing from uh, our Japanese colleague on, on your approach, but I know that there's a great commonality in our approaches to these global challenges, and that perhaps out of this uh, meeting today, we will understand that commonality better. And, and maybe even- at everything I wanted to say. Oh, good. <laughs> and, then, and then also that maybe out of this, we will, we will be able to agree uh, some practical areas of further cooperation between Ireland and Japan. So thank you very much for that.